David, uh, you're a key person in many respects, certainly also in terms of the news, but in the preparation and so on. You're a key person in relation to the events of the 11th of November, 1975. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what was your particular feeling when the whole day was over and it was done? Well, I think I recorded in my diary, phew, what a day. <laughs> I saw that. That was, that was the end of the day. And of course, the day ended with uh, a household dinner at Government House for three young army officers who were being interviewed to choose the next army ADC. So it was sort of back to business as usual uh, for the uh, vice-regal household. Malcolm Fraser, in his recent biography, has again tried to argue that when he was telephoned by Sir John Kerr, Sir John tried to require him to agree to certain conditions, mm -hmm. which of course would have signalled to him what Sir John may have intended. And uh, Sir John had denied this. Yes. W what is uh, your position on this? Well, as soon as the phone call was over, Sir John called me in. Uh, I was with him in the morning when um, a family member telephoned with uh, information about one of the grandchildren. As it was a personal family call, I, I left the room, obviously. Um, not long afterwards, he called me back in, and in the space of only a few moments, he'd received a telephone call from Mr Whitlam to tell him that the government and opposition leaders had failed to reach agreement at their meeting that morning, and that he, Whitlam, would be coming out bef before lunch to recommend a half-Senate election. And then the Governor-General told me that he had immediately telephoned Mr Fraser just to confirm that there was no change in the opposition's position on the uh, blocking of supply. And Fraser confirmed it and uh, that was the end of the conversation. Um, I understand that um, Bob Ellicott was present when Fraser received the Governor-General's phone call. And he's on the record as saying that it didn't last long enough for the matters that Fraser now alleges to have been canvassed. My take on it is that uh, over the weekend and uh, the preceding day, the Governor-General had asked me to draft a letter and uh, prepare a letter for Mr Fraser to sign, accepting the traditional caretaker conventions. No mention was made in that letter of what Fraser now alleges, that he was forewarned about he would be asked to agree to, um, nor were those two matters that Fraser now alludes to ever discussed with me by Sir John. And of course the, uh, uh, the note which Fraser now claims to uh, confirm his account of the telephone conversation, uh, which has been reproduced in his book, shows that it was dated and signed after the entries had been made. Uh, it was dated and signed on another day by a different, entirely different pen, so the note appears to have been some later fabrication. Uh, my, my understanding is that uh, Sir John simply sought confirmation from Fraser that um, the opposition was still standing firm. After Mr Whitlam had been dismissed and Fraser was to be sworn in beforehand, the Governor-General asked him if he would agree to the standard caretaker conventions. And the Governor-General read him the letter which we had prepared and which Fraser would be asked to sign. That would have come as no surprise that the I, caretaker conventions would it to a well, potential Prime Minister? The caretaker conventions uh, have been around for a long time. Uh, I can remember them right through my public service career with former Prime Ministers and previous elections. And as the Governor-General read the letter to Fraser that Fraser would be asked to sign. I observed the two of them. I was um, standing just to one side of the desk. I formed the clear impression Fraser was hearing them for the first time. They certainly weren't part of a conversation with him earlier that morning, so I certainly don't believe Fraser's ac account of the telephone call. Malcolm Fraser suggests there was an additional condition which never appeared in the letter. That That's is, right. There'd be no action against uh, the Whitlam government. No, no... Uh, no legal action and no royal commissions. Well, of course, I recall that when um, Sankey wanted to launch a prosecution later against the uh, Whitlam ministers, 
um, Fraser wanted Ellicott as Attorney General to stop the pr private prosecution, which I gather the Attorney General had capacity to do. And Ellicott refused, and I think Ellicott actually resigned from the Ministry over it some time later. I see. Why the 11th of November? What, did Sir John choose the 11th of November? No, no Whitlam chose it. Whitlam chose it. Um, the 11th of November was the last day on which he could order, or have the Governor-General order an election to be held on the last available day in that year, which was the 13th of December. Advice from the Electoral Commission was that it would not be practicable for them to hold an election later than the 13th of December because they needed to lock in um, the availability of schools and school halls and um, teaching staff to, as polling officials so that the 11th of November was the last day on which an election could be initiated to be held that year. And Fraser chose that day to recommend a half Senate election. It couldn't have solved the supply crisis because the senators who would have been elected in a half Senate election could not have taken their seats until after July, at the 1st of July 1976, seven months later. Am, I, am I right in assuming the state governors, or the, three, the, the premiers rather, would have had to have agreed to that? Uh, well, the, uh, that's the other point. Uh, uh, Senate elections are not ordered by the Governor General. Um, he accepts the advice of the Prime Minister on an election timetable, but he then has to ask the state governors to agree, because it's for state governors to issue writs for the election of senators for their states. And there had already been speculation in the media that uh, at least one and maybe up to as many as four state premiers were contemplating advising their governors to ignore a request from the Governor-General and to not issue writs for the election of senators under a half Senate election. See, under a double dissolution election, the senators would immediately have taken their place as soon as Parliament could meet. But under a half Senate election, they couldn't take their places, the new senators couldn't take their places for another seven months. That couldn't have solved an immediate supply crisis because it would not have changed the numbers in the Senate. It's true that there were to be elections for territory senators for the first time, two for the Northern Territory, two for the Australian Capital Territory. But the, uh, the relevant Electoral Act amendments had been so designed as to ensure that uh, the parties would get, the major parties, would get one Senate seat in each territory. And that certainly wouldn't disturb the balance in the Senate at all. Even after 1975, both parties still... They still get one each, yes. yes. Good. Thank you very much.